Hello, this is Chef John from foodwishes.com with butcher steak. That's right, believe it or not, there's a steak that's as tender as filet mignon, has more flavor than ribeye, and costs significantly less than both. But it is not widely known or used because the butchers kind of kept it to themselves. Hence the name butcher steak. But this amazing piece of meat, also referred to as a hanger steak, is relatively easy to find, and if you know how to trim it up, very easy to work with. So with apologies to butchers everywhere for exposing this secret, let's go ahead and get started with the star of the show, the butcher steak. As I mentioned, also commonly referred to as a hanger steak. And it's sort of an odd looking piece of meat, but nothing to be afraid of. It's basically two muscles separated by a very, very tough piece of connective tissue. And please let the record show that piece of meat was gouged out before I started. But anyway, the whole key to working with this is properly trimming it. And that's going to involve two phases. First, we're going to remove any and all silver skin from the surface, as well as any other pieces of fat we want to trim off. And there's really no complicated techniques here. As long as you have a thin, sharp knife, and you slide it between the membrane and the meat, you should be able to trim that stuff off without much problem. And as usual, on the surface, besides the silver skin, as we call it, which are the much tougher membranes, we're also going to have just pieces of good old-fashioned regular fat. So to what extent you trim that stuff off is up to you, since you are, of course, the Draymond Green of how lean. But while that regular surface fat will add some moisture and flavor, the connective tissue and the piece separating the two muscles will not. The only thing that stuff's going to add is a lot of annoying chewing. So what we'll do is trim both sides very carefully, making sure to remove any of that surface silver skin, before we separate the two muscles and trim out the toughest of all connective tissue. And basically my strategy here is to find that seam with the tip of my knife, which after that first phase of trimming is gonna be pretty easy to see. And as we sort of slowly, fairly carefully trim down, what we'll do is try to keep our knife sliding against that tissue so it's not going into the meat too much. And of course we have to be realistic. If we only do this once or twice a year like I do, we're not gonna be that great at it. But that's fine, we don't have to be. So we'll just continue to trim between those two muscles, going as slowly and carefully as we want. And these pieces I'm cutting out might not look like that big of a deal, but they really are virtually impossible to chew. So with that in mind, we'll continue on cutting down and through. And like I said, we want to make sure our knife doesn't sort of turn into the meat. Okay, so cutting through that connective tissue is okay, or on either side of it, but try not to let your knife turn into the meat. So that's what I did, and eventually separated those two muscles. And then once that's been accomplished, we can go ahead and finish trimming these and making steaks. And as you might be able to see, one side is usually a little bigger than the other. So let me start with the bigger side, which sometimes has this lobe of meat at the end that's sort of separated naturally. So what we'll do is trim that piece off. That's going to give us sort of an extra bonus fifth steak. And then we'll go ahead and finish up any remaining trimming, which was kind of minimal on this piece because the smaller piece got most of the connective tissue. So that side's looking pretty good for now. And we'll go ahead and move to the smaller piece. And using that same technique of sliding the knife under, we will remove that center piece of sinew that I've heard a lot of people refer to as a tendon, but I don't think that's a tendon. But anyway, no matter what it's called, we want to remove all of it. And I really should have kept this in the same position, but I thought it was blocking the camera with my other hand. So I turned it this way thinking you'd get a better look. But ironically, I made it harder to see what I was doing. But the good news is, this is going to be much easier than I'm making it sound and look. Since that membrane, as well as the other connective tissue on the surface, is almost impossible to miss. But anyway, let's go ahead and fast forward to when I was finishing that up. Since there's really only so much of that you can watch before it becomes uninteresting. And I know, that was a couple minutes ago. But anyway, once that's completed, we can move on to cutting these into steaks. And to do that, I'm simply going to cut both of those pieces of meat in half. And once those have been divided, we're going to end up with four what I think are perfect portions of steak. Plus, of course, don't forget our bonus fifth steak. And other than maybe a little extra cleanup here and there, that is pretty much it. Oh, and one quick production note. This piece of meat is amazing cooked whole like a steak, but also makes like the world's best skewer. So generally my game plan is I save the two biggest ones to cook as steaks, and then maybe I'll take those two smaller pieces and that lobe and cut those into like one or two inch chunks and skewer those for the grill. So don't be surprised if you see a video for that later in the season. But for now, I'm gonna take the two best pieces and season those up with some salt and pepper, and we'll go ahead and cook those up in a pan so I can finish the video by eating something. And while this very versatile steak lends itself to pretty much any cooking method, today I'm going to be searing these in a pan in some clarified butter. So generally I start this on high and then turn it down to about medium. And of course you cook these to whatever doneness you want, but I'm recommending we go to about 125 internal temp, 
which after resting should end up about 130, which is going to give us pretty much a perfect medium rare. And as usual, I never want you to go by time, but this took me about 12 minutes start to finish, which I guess is like 4 minutes per side, since the way these things are shaped, you do end up with sort of a third side. But regardless, as I said, I like to start off on high heat, and then after the first turn, maybe we'll back it down to medium high to medium, and continue on until we think we're done. And fair warning, this butcher steak, also known as hanger steak, is incredibly juicy. Which means if you pan roast it like we're doing here, you're going to build up a very significant fond. Which of course are all those caramelized meat juices at the bottom of the pan. And it's going to get very dark, and spots are going to look like they're burnt, but they're not. Well actually they are, but it doesn't matter. When we deglaze this, it's not going to taste burnt. But anyway, we're getting ahead of ourselves. Step one is to evenly sear these on all sides, until the internal temp reaches about 125 at which point we will turn off our heat and remove those to a plate to rest. And I do suggest tenting those with a little bit of foil to retain some of that heat while we finish our pan sauce. And of course to do that, all we need to do is splash in some chicken stock or water. And as you may know, that liquid's gonna release all that cooked on goodness from the bottom. So we'll splash in some stock and turn our heat back on to medium and give that a stir with a whisk or of course freakishly small wooden spoon. And over the course of the next couple minutes, two things are gonna happen. That fond will totally dissolve into your liquid, as well as, as you can see, it's going to reduce down. And once those two things do happen, what we'll do is reduce our heat to low and add in our final ingredients, which will start with any and all accumulated juices. Okay, if you're not going to add back in the accumulated juices, you probably shouldn't be making pan sauces. And then I'm also going to drizzle in a little splash of balsamic vinegar, which I did over the camera from about four feet up, which is why it splashed everywhere. So feel free to add yours like a normal person. And then last but not least, we will add in a little bit of cold butter that we've cut in small chunks. And if it seems like our liquid reduced a little too much, which I think mine did, we can also add another splash of stock. And then all we have to do is keep this pan and or butter moving until it disappears. And believe it or not, that's all that's involved in making this very fast but devastatingly effective pan sauce. Of course, it's not really ready to use until we taste for salt, which I did. And I went ahead and tossed in a little more of that. And that's it, by now our steak should be rested and ready to slice. And I'm secretly kind of hoping you've never had butcher steak before, because you're simply not going to believe how juicy and flavorful it is. Okay, imagine something as tender as filet mignon, with the same fatty richness as a ribeye, but with the intense beefy flavor of like a brisket or a short rib. That's pretty much what we have going on here. I know, it sounds too good to be true, but it is. So I went ahead and sliced that up and served it next to some french fries since that's never a bad combo. And we'll go ahead and spoon over our pan sauce. And that's it, our butcher steak is ready to enjoy. And sure, it's gonna take about 15 or 20 minutes of some fairly annoying trimming. But as soon as you start eating this, you're gonna realize it was totally worth it. Plus, it's gonna give you a great reason to finally go out and buy that bony knife. So once properly prepped, I really do love everything about this cut of meat. And as I mentioned earlier, it's just as good on the grill. Although you don't really get to make a pan sauce that way. But whatever, you'll come up with something. Maybe serve it with a Bernays. And if you're watching this in real time, I realize there's only a couple days to go before Father's Day. But you know what makes a much better last minute Father's Day gift than a tie? Besides literally everything? This. That's right, you could give dad a big old butcher steak and show him how to make it. Now that is being a good child. But regardless, whether you're gonna make this for a special occasion or not, I really do hope you give this a try soon. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy.